Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 31st of July and the week ahead beginning the 3rd of August. And it's been what I would categorise, I think, as a bit of a um, bit of a mixed week because we've had a decent performance from US markets at the time of recording this video. Um, but European markets, on the other hand, have significantly underwhelmed. And I think a large part of that, I think, is really down to the fact that there are rising concerns um, that the economic recovery that we've seen starting to unfold in the past few weeks could be on the cusp of running out of road. What we also have to remember in the overall scheme of things is the fact that US markets are being distorted quite significantly by the big tech stocks of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, and the Microsofts, because they've posted some fairly decent earnings numbers over the course of the past few days. And they make up around about 40% of the US market, um, particularly the S&P 500. So if we look at the S&P 500 in the case of this chart here, um, we can see that we are still pretty much in the uptrend that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks or so. Um, which obviously, all by itself, um, helps to underpin the rebound and the rally that we're seeing in US markets more broadly. If we say, for example, look at the NASDAQ performance this week, that's also quite well borne out in terms of the gains. And we're still pretty much close to the all time highs um, of the last month or so, though it's interesting to note that we actually haven't broken above it yet. But what we are seeing is a significant outperformance on the part of the big tech sector, um, which is, I would, I hesitate to say artificially elevating the valuations of US stocks, but it's certainly not hindering them, um, particularly if you look at it in the context of the Russell 2000 here that we have here, we can see that the record highs um, that we've seen in that particular index, we haven't got anywhere near close to. So I think that gives us a better indication of, of where we are index wise. And of course, if we look at European stocks, it's a completely different story altogether. Um, we saw a really big sell off yesterday um, on the Thursday, the 30th of July. Obviously, we're coming to the end of the month now. Um, but ultimately, the big, the big losses that we saw for European markets. I think is largely down to a concern over the effect that rising COVID-19 cases are likely to have, not only in the economy, in, not only to the economies of Southern Europe, I mean, in particular Spain, given the quarantine rules that have been put in place by France, Norway and the United Kingdom, but also the fact that we're starting to see an increase in cases pretty much across the world, in, in Australia, um, in Japan, in Hong Kong. Um, all the while, we're seeing economic data thus far um, hold up fairly well in Europe. But the catalyst, I think, for the fall that we saw on Thursday was the fact that the continuing claims data in the US edged back higher for the first time since, middle of, since the middle of May. Um, we hit a low, we hit a low around about 16 million and it's gone up by 900,000 to just over 17 million um, for the continuing claims data up to the 18th of July. Um, obviously concerns about lockdowns, um, re-lockdowns taking place in the US, arguing over a stimulus plan between the Republicans and the Democrats, the increasingly unpredictable behaviour of President Trump and the partisanship over a new stimulus bill between the Republicans and the Democrats, um, less than three months until a presidential election. And you've also seen big, big sell off in the dollar. Um, yields have come in a little bit there, or real yields have come in a little bit there. And gold has been a key beneficiary of that over the course of the past few weeks. But the dollar has really taken a tumble um, in, the, in the past few days trading at three-year lows against the euro and um, seeing big declines 
in our CMC markets dollar index as well. So this week has really been characterized by not only weakness in European markets, a stronger euro, a stronger pound, and a weaker dollar, but we've also seen a big move high in gold prices to new record highs. So that really, I think, in the wake of the numbers that we've seen this week, and it's really been more of a focus on earnings numbers, um, really, really decent outperformance in terms of expectations for the big tech stocks, but we've seen um, uh, really poor earnings announcements from the, the likes of the UK banks. We have the last of the UK banks reporting this coming week, uh, beginning the 3rd of August with the latest numbers from HSBC. Um, and I will cover them in this, um, in this little summary. We've also um, seen some poor numbers from the likes of European car makers, Volkswagen posted a big loss. Um, Santander, obviously going back to banks briefly, Santander took an 11 billion euro write down. Royal Dutch Shell um, posted some disappointing numbers. Well, not so much disappointing, they were slightly better than expected, but I think a large part of the reason for the Royal Dutch Shell outperformance a little bit was the fact that they cut the dividend. And we'll be looking ahead to BP's numbers um, as well in the context of whether or not we can expect to see a dividend cut there. So looking at BP's first half numbers, they're due out on the 4th. We've got HSBC on the 3rd. We, have, we may have, if we've got time, have a look at uh, Cineworld and uh, Walt Disney or Disney, um, as they are, they are also due out in this upcoming week. But the main focus in terms of the macro data, um, given what we've seen unfold this week um, in terms of concerns about a stalling of the economic recovery is the latest manufacturing and services PMIs for July. Now, if there is any evidence of a slowing of economic activity, this is probably the first place that we're likely to see it. Um, and in that context, I think in terms of services, the services sector, in particular Spain and Italy, will be most closely scrutinized in terms of the effect that some of the travel quarantines that have been put in will have had on economic activity in, in Spain in particular. Before we get started on that, let's have a quick look at Euro dollar because we've seen a massive breakout in Euro dollar this week. Um, we've seen it break above the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of the down move from the peaks in 2018 to the lows in um, earlier this year. While we stay above 118.25, there's a decent possibility that we could go and retest or test this trend line from these, from these peaks all the way back in 2008. So we are approaching a very key inflection point in terms of euro dollar. So I've got this I've got this resistance level. It's slightly it's slightly dubious in terms of this chart at around about 120. But I think as long as we hold above 118.25 um, or 118, 117.80 there or thereabouts, I think there's a decent chance that can we move we can move as high as 120. But I think overall that should be it should be the limit of any further euro dollar upward move and we have come an awful long way in a short space of time you know and on the basis of the fundamentals it doesn't really support it but at the moment the dollar is having a little bit of a crisis of confidence and that's why we're seeing um, the big gains that we're not just seeing in the euro but also in the pound as well so if we look at the pound we've seen a similar breakout above that 127.60 area which I've, which I've been banging on about for quite some time now in, in terms of its importance. And now I think really the next level um, on this move higher, are this series of highs through here between February and March, around about 132, 132.20. So at some point over the course of the next few days, I would expect 
that we might see a little bit of profit taking in and around that 132 area. What has surprised me a little bit is the underperformance in euro sterling. Um, we do appear to have found a little bit of a short term peak at around about 91.80. Um, we are starting to trade sideways a little bit. Um, so I would keep close attention on the um, 90 20 the 90 area here as well as the 50 day moving average if we are going to break lower out of this slightly sloping upward trend then i would expect the price action to cross below the 50 day because we've it's acted as a nice area of support all the way up here so i think a break below 90 could trigger a little bit of stop loss selling and for a trigger down to around about the 89.20 area over the course of the next few days. Very technically driven is Euro Sterling. Um, so I think a break of the 50 day moving average would give us calls for optimism that we could see further Sterling gains and, and Euro losses. OK, so let's have a look um, at the um, overall calendar for next week. And I think another reason why I think the Sterling upside the pound upside is likely to be a little bit limited um, to, towards 132 is for a very good reason. And that's we've got a Bank of England meeting. We've got a Bank of England rate meeting on Thursday. And I think it's important in that context to give you a little bit of a little bit of preamble around the Bank of England, because I think if we look at it in the round, there's been an awful lot of chit chat. From various Bank of England policymakers in recent weeks about the likelihood of further rate cuts um, ahead of this meeting, probably, probably in September if we are going to get any move on policy. But it will be very much data dependent. Obviously, we've heard reports in the media of um, isolated lockdowns in the north of England. And while I doubt the efficacy of cutting rates further. You've only got to look at the numbers um, that we saw from the UK banks um, this month. The, the net interest margin has declined in every single case, eroding their ability to generate profits and also eroding their ability to um, offset any potential for an increase in non-performing loans. So the Bank of England will be hobbling UK banks' ability to generate future profits, to try and offset any further deterioration in their balance sheet. So it would seem a remarkably stupid thing to do for the Bank of England to cut rates into negative territory. But um, experience has taught me never to underestimate the stupidity of central bankers. Um, so I do not expect um, any change in policy at this meeting, given the fact that even if the Bank of England were to ease, it's unlikely that consumers will be inclined to spend. As it is over the past four months, consumer credit has seen a repayment of 16 billion pounds in the past three to four months. That's more than the entire amount consumers borrowed in 2019, which was around about 12 billion pounds. So there's no appetite to spend money. There's no appetite to borrow money. So really the level of interest rates is neither here nor there. Moving on to PMIs for July, we've got uh, PMIs from Germany, France, the UK, Europe, Asia and the US. Um, so I think what I'm going to be looking for here is any evidence that the really big moves higher that we saw in June are sustained into July, particularly around the tourism sector in Spain and Italy, who rely so much on that sector for revenues and economic activity. Um, and I think the quarantines bear out the risk to the July PMIs, particularly in holiday destinations. And the fact that some of the measures being introduced by the UK government are going to deter foreign travel. So that will, by implication, affect destinations as well as um, arising cases in, 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 those particular, in those particular holiday centres. Um, so services PMIs. Um, it is hoped will improve for Spain and Italy from the 50.2 and 46.4 numbers that we saw in June. Um, but more, more important than that, Germany, France and the UK 
showed some really decent improvements in June to 56.752 and 56.6. So we want those mid 50s to hold for the big three um, to have any confidence that the European economy, certainly in terms of the big three, will remain fairly resilient. Manufacturing, um, again, um, there should be improvements from the levels in June particularly given the recent flash PMIs from the US, UK and Germany, um, which were by and large fairly positive. So um, those are the PMIs, covered the Bank of England rate meeting. Um, let's finish off the macro with the US employment report, because I think that's really the headline number of the week in light of the fact that we've seen a weaker dollar. And also by virtue of the fact that we've seen um, an increase in continuing claims to 17 million after a drop to 16 million in the first part of July. So, quick recap we've seen 20.7 million jobs lost in April. We've, since then, we've seen a rebound due to furloughed, worker, furloughed workers returning to the workforce, and the unemployment rate is around about 11.1% and seven and a half million jobs have come back in May and June. This month's July payrolls report is expected to see something in the region of a million to two million new workers return to the labour force. Now, an important caveat to that is this July payrolls report is only up to and including the 14th of July. So it may give a slightly false impression of where the US labour market is because most of the re-lockdowns and what have you and the bulk of the um, restrictions that some US states have imposed have come post 14th of July. So we have we did start to see a rise in infections in the beginning of July but that trend has accelerated to the back end of July. So it may not give us a truly accurate figure of what the US labour market is doing. Um, nonetheless, we still expect the unemployment rate to come down to 10.5%. And the big question then will be um, whether the jobs rebound that we saw in May and June and hopefully July will be able to continue into August. And we'll only know that when, the September, when, when I do the September um, webinar to analyse the, the August payrolls report. So I will be hosting a non-farm payrolls webinar. Uh, 1.15 on Friday the 7th of August. Please feel free to join me. You can basically find, you can subscribe, sign up to the webinar on the CMC Markets website. I think it'll be a fairly interesting number. Um, and a big question will be is, will the dollar fallen further in the time from when I've recorded this to the time when I'm sitting there talking to you about the numbers that, that are due to be released? We also have an RBA rate meeting, and I think that will be instructive given what's happening in Victoria um, right now and the mass lockdowns being implemented there. Despite the weakness that we're seeing in the Australian economy, we've seen a big rebound in the Aussie dollar coming up to the 200 week moving average. Now, that's likely to be a fairly decent uh, resistance level. And one of the reasons why the Aussie has been um, rallying as strongly as it has is it tends to has a tendency to act as a bit of a proxy for gold. And gold has been posting some fairly decent gains over the past uh, few days, trading at new record highs. And really, I think the next target is the $2,000 an ounce level. And I think unless the economic data starts to show signs of picking up or the infection rates start to decline over the course of the next few days and weeks, then really it's only a matter of time before we hit that $2,000 level. As long as we hold above this here, this level here, around about $1,900 an ounce. So keep an eye on $1,900 an ounce. That could be a key support for a move towards 2000 and through 2000. Okay, so let's move on to BP in light of Royal Dutch Shell's numbers that we saw um, in uh, in in July, a couple of days ago, as it happens. Now, in June, like Shell, BP took a significant asset write down, $15 billion worth on top of the 10,000 job losses it announced um, as it looks to uh, restructure the business, bolster its balance sheets, 
uh, balance sheet against the sharp side in oil prices. Now, the one thing the BP did not do that Shell did was cut its dividend. Okay, BP hasn't done that yet. Now, I think the big test, I think, for BP's numbers will be it has been trying to um, sell off assets. It's hit its target of $15 billion of disposals by year end. It's just raised another $5 billion by selling its petrochemicals business to Ineos for $5 billion. But I don't think that's going to cut it. Its debt levels are still very, very high. Its dividend yield is still well above 10%. And as Shell showed last week, the cut in the dividend actually helped the company retain some extra cash and actually turn a profit um, in its second quarter or its first half. So BP would be well advised to do the same. It's not going to be popular. Cutting the dividend never is, but they don't have to scrap it. They just have to reduce it. It's about it's about balance sheet preservation, capital optimization. And I think really it would be very unwise if the if BP continued to pay a dividend that isn't really supported by its cash flow. So Decent support in and around 280p. Um, momentum doesn't look great on this particular chart, and there is a risk that we could see further losses unless um, BP CEO Bernard Looney convinces that he has a long term strategy for turning the business around. Early on Monday, HSBC um, completes the list of UK banks' um, latest earnings numbers. And they've not been pretty, if I'm honest with you. There's been an awful lot of money set aside in terms of provisions. Um, Barclays, RBS, or NetWest as it's known now, Lloyd's have set aside billions of pounds, around about three billion pounds each, three to four billion pounds each, with an expectation of around about five billion pounds each by the year end. And HSBC has already set aside £2.4 billion in respect of non-performing loans in Q1. They've said that this could rise as high as £7 billion over the rest of the year. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not they revise that number, how much they set aside in Q2. More importantly, HSBC is a little bit unique in the context of that it's in the eye of the storm over the new Hong Kong national security law, as well as Huawei has put put them in the middle between China and the US. Um, so um, it'll be very interesting to see how they navigate that particular obstacle. And there has been some talk that the bank might look at selling its US business um, to try and raise a little bit of extra cash, but also try and lance, um, lance the boil of that particular business as it, as it becomes a pressure point for the Trump administration. So first half numbers for HSBC, HSBC on the 3rd of August. And as we can see here from this chart, it doesn't look a pretty picture. The trend is very much down. We've seen the share price break lower. And we are now at the lowest levels since 2009. We're at 10 year lows. So we've seen some significant underperformance on the part of HSBC with the risk that we could well go lower. We've also got the latest numbers from Cineworld, and again, they've deferred the opening of their cinema businesses in the UK as well as the US. So it means they're continuing to burn cash at a rate of knots, and they've also um, had to cope with the fact that Disney have delayed the release of the latest Star Wars and Avatar films. So that's not going to help. But having said that, if the cinemas are open, aren't open, there's not really much they can do about that because um, people aren't going to be able to see them anyway. Um, but um, still above, still above the March lows. Hoping to see some progress on this front on Cineworld and Disney. 200-day um, moving average is acting as a decent resistance level. Um, be interesting to see how well Disney Plus has done. Whether or not they've been able to cement the market share that they gained in Q1, in Q2 rather, um, and um, whether or not 
they've seen similar sorts of subscription boosts in the manner that Netflix um, have seen and what their outlook is going forward in terms of theme park revenues um, as well as um, subscription revenues. So that's it for this week. Um, just quickly, just quickly remind you all again of next week's non-farm payrolls webinar. Um, starts at 1.15 on the 7th of August and I will be talking you all through the latest payrolls data as well as obviously giving you a heads up for the week ahead as well. So that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets. <laughs>